So here we are, audio product production techniques, week two. It's Thursday, September 12th. Welcome. We're going to do an overview of the PTA 2 assignment. Make sure that everybody has a nice overview of the steps that need to be completed. And then all you need to do is rehearse and connect the dots for eight minutes. Uh, again, what I've seen from last week, everything is looking real nice. Everybody's getting the idea about watching the prep session, practicing, and then connecting the dots and getting it all done in eight minutes. So that's really nice to see. So I'm just going to repeat this. What I would like to do is I'm going to run through the entire PTA 2. I'm just going to just going to spitball through the whole thing here, if you will. And then at the end, I'm going to say, okay, let's take questions. So I'm just going to respectfully say that if I start, when I say, okay, here we go, and I start, if a question appears in the go-to, I'm not going to see it because I'm going to just completely take it off the screen. So if you, if you just happen to forget and type a question in there, don't feel like I'm deliberately um, strong-arming. You know what I'm saying? Just know that I'm holding questions till the end. And then at the end, I'll say, hey, okay, what questions do we have? What can we work through? So welcome, everybody, and let's get started. So we are going to do an overview of Pro Tools Assignment 2. Uh, this probably looks very familiar to you at this point. It may look a little different to some of you. Just want to remind you that the first two pages of each of these assignments are the same. The first two pages are the same. What I want to remind you about is the fact that you can click this laptop here to download the prep session, which is, as it says, a short instructional video that provides a succinct review of the week two material. So it's, you know, last minute cliff notes, if you will. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, I know that I had a little bit of confusion with uh, one of the guys that are in here right now, but I think, I think everything makes sense to both of us now. Uh, but if you do need to use Dropbox, okay, this, this is what the piece that I want to clarify right here. You must upload your file. If you can't get your file to upload to FSO, that's totally fine. It's not a big deal at all, okay? But what everybody did, everybody pretty much did this correctly. You upload the file to your own Dropbox, and then you create a download link. So right here, you create the download link, and then paste that link into the Word doc. So the download link means that it's in your Dropbox. And when we click on that link, we download it to our computer because we have to have that for uh, the class archive that we match with the um, system information in the beginning of the video. So there's a little bit of a process on our end, but we uh, are requesting, and that's why we wanted to specify the download link. Now, what I will say is that this document got updated recently. So if somebody downloaded their assignment on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, then this document wouldn't have looked like this last week. So uh, I'm talking about for PTA 1, but for PTA 2, obviously it looks like this. So at any rate, I wanted to point out the uh, use of Dropbox just to clarify. Pretty much everybody had it right. Just remember, you need, to, you need to get the link. You need to copy the link so that we can download that. And then everybody's been really good, but just watch uh, these important questions watch how you're naming. Some people miss the naming. Now, is this going to affect a grade? I'm going to be honest. No, but I just want you to be sure that you're treating this in some sense like a job order, you know, because we got to have a vision about this. You know, none of this is going to be real in a year. We're going to be moving forward in what we want to do and our passion for our music or whatever we're in this program for. So we're always going to try to keep you focused and detail oriented. So when you see the feedback on your assignments, if you think it's something that's petty and it shouldn't be counted against you, just remember we set up all the expectations in the guidelines and then we give you feedback based on the guidelines that were created. So it's all feedback, okay? It's, no, it's not being hyper picky about anything. But here's the point that I'm making. When you name your file, remember you need to name it first name, last name, and then for this week would be PTA2. So I know that there's a the habit is that you name it last name, first name, <clears throat> okay? But we want you to name it this way for our file registering on our end, okay? So I'm just pointing this out. You know, again, it doesn't make a remix sound better. It doesn't make anybody a better producer, right? It's just detail orientation 
just be careful about how you're naming your files, okay? Um, <clears throat> so spacebar down to the next one. So let's talk about getting into the assignment here. So the other thing I just want to point out real quick is just these headers. There was a question, um, it was actually from last month, but remember these little headers here, these orange headers in the top of each one, these are the little hints of what we're getting into. So it kind of gives you a, a, uh, a guideline, I guess, in a sense of, okay, wait, this step has to do with editing commands and memory locations or, okay, monitor modes. When I get down here, I need to move memory locations. Look, we're going to use memory locations this week. Memory location two, memory location three, memory location four. So just be careful because I've seen assignments in the past come in for PTA two where students aren't using the memory locations. So just be careful because you, you need to make sure that you can see your memory locations. And I'll show you that here in just a second. So if I, if I show you the session, the session you will download from FSO. If you've looked in the assignment yet. Uh, I don't know, but there is a, a session there for you. When you open it up, it'll look like this. So <clears throat> here's a memory locations window. This is found under window memory locations. And what we can do is we can set up memory locations, which there's a part of this exercise. You'll be setting up, deleting and updating memory locations. So it'll help to clarify <clears throat> the use and the creation of them. But we can basically set up memory locations in Pro Tools so that we can jump to different scenes in the software. And if you've used other software, then you know, you're know you probably familiar with this. But at any rate, we're in location one. So if you open up the session and you don't see the memory locations, remember you need to go under the window mem menu and grab your memory locations. Now, if you have a uh, Apple keyboard with a numeric pad, you can use Command-5 and toggle that memory locations Floating window. So some of the basics last week when we were talking about the edit window, we kind of started to go through this, this top area here in Pro Tools to kind of get a feel for what all of these um, items are. <clears throat> so Pro Tools has four modes uh, that we operate in. We have shuffle mode, slip mode, grid mode, and spot mode. Okay. And I could show you examples of all those uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, shuffle mode is great for when you're editing uh, some dialogue. You do have to be careful. It's also great for audiobook editing or if you are doing some type of a live seminar, like say you were like at an investment seminar and you were recording the audio, you had a videographer and you were there recording audio and then you brought it back to your Pro Tools system for editing. Well, if you just kind of take the ride here with me, this bass track, if I had it in shuffle mode, if this was not a bass track, but a vocal, and imagine that this is just like VO dialogue. And now let's say that the, the artist or the speaker started to say something here, but then he noticed that he made a, uh, a mistake. And so he started back here. Well, if I was to edit this out here and I was in shuffle mode, notice I'm in shuffle mode and I hit delete, notice how the clip slides down, right? And if I had to edit out something here and I deleted so that clip is constantly nudging itself to the next, uh, the end of the uh, prior clip. So that's shuffle mode in the most basic sense. Slip mode will make sense to you. I can make any type of uh, edit selection freely in this clip and then delete it. I can also, in slip mode, I can take a clip. See, I'm using the grabber tool right here. This is called the grabber tool. I can use and I can slip around and make these subtle changes, right? Now, if I do that in grid mode, you'll notice that I pop into grid mode. Well, grid mode has, and guys, again, as I go through this, some of this stuff is gonna be really, really new, and your brain is gonna start firing on all cylinders, going, wait, did I hear this before? Do I understand this? Why, wait, why don't I, why, I, I should understand this? And you just start having all this self-talk. So remember, a lot of this stuff's gonna feel new, or it might sound familiar, or you may know everything and be bored. So get the golden nugget if you're bored. But if it's all new and flying fast, just sit back and just know that all you need to do is just remind yourself, I'm just taking it all in. I'm just taking it all in. And don't get hung up on remembering any, anything, okay? So just pretend you're watching a movie. 
Keep the highlights in your mind. Jot a note in your text doc if you need to, but don't try to hang on to every word and remember everything right now, okay? So grid mode, our grid mode here, you see I'm in, I'm in a timed grid mode. I'm in a minute second grid mode here. But if I go to bars and beats, see I just click that and I drop to bars and beats. Now I'm in a one bar grid mode. See that one bar, half, quarter. Notice you see the subdivisions filling in here. Eighth note, 16th note. So you're constantly seeing more subdivisions appear, right? So now if I'm going to just stay in grid mode and move my clip, now I'm moving based on the grid, okay? And then spot mode, if I click on this clip, I'm at 5-1. This is my main counter here. If I click, if I have spot mode enabled and I click on my clip, I get a spot dialog. I'm in bars and beats. I could be in minutes and seconds or these other options, but I'm in bars and beats. What if I want to put that right at the beginning of the session? Start 1100, beginning of session. If I hit return, boom, there it is, back at the beginning of the session. So just a quick little run through of shuffle, slip, spot, grid. You'll see that come up more. Um, this changes the height of the audio waveforms. If I had MIDI in the session, this would change the height of the MIDI notes. These right here, these are your, um, oh God. Thank you. See, great pop-up menu, zoom memory. I just drew a blank there for a second, but your zoom memory. So if you zoom in and you like that zoom and you want to set that for number one, hold command and click it. Now, let me go to two. If I want to go back to one, I just hit the number one on my uh, on the QWERTY section of the keyboard, that top sequence of one through zero. I just hit one and it jumps back. So if I had a real tight zoom here and I wanted that to be number one, I can hold command, click number one. There I'm at number four. I hit QWERTY number one and then it jumps back. So I can have some zoom memories programmed into these buttons here. Okay. Now, some of these are zoom toggles. You can do this uh, via the shortcuts that we showed you last week, right? This is tab to transients. We will get to that. That's a very nice feature in Pro Tools. Uh, mirrored MIDI editing. Uh, you may see John next week do some of that in his live session with the uh, remixing. Automation follows edit. Uh, this will come up in week four. Uh, but this is basically when you're editing, if you want automation to go along with that edit, it can or not. I leave it on unless I choose to turn it off. Link timeline and edit selection. Now this will come up too. I won't bring it up now, but it's a, it's a nice feature. And I would say most of the time you'll leave it on, but there are times when you may want to turn it off. Okay, link track and edit selection. I think this should probably be left on most of the time. If you'll notice here, right now, I'm, I'm working in this playlist. I'm working in this ba base playlist because you can see that I'm highlighting in this, this edit playlist, right? Notice that the track is highlighted, okay? The button is called link, edit, and track selection, right? So if I go to click in this drum loop in this playlist, watch... Just know I'm going to click here, but watch the track name. So you'll notice that the track selection follows the edit selection. So I make an edit selection here. That's the track selection. I make an edit selection here. That's the track selection. Now, you'll see the shortcut again. If we had more tracks in, this would make uh, more sense. But if I want to, if I want to say I made a, say I made this selection on this drum loop, right? And I wanted to make the exact same selection below. I said, oh, you know what? Actually, I want to make that selection on that bass track. Well, I could just hit. Now, you have to have this button lit. You have to have this A to Z button lit here. Okay. But if I just hit semicolon, then I can move up and down. And notice, see, the edit selection and the track selection follow along with each other. And if you had 10 tracks showing, you could just keep hitting semicolon and you would go down. Even if I just had my insertion point like this and I wanted to move down to the next track, semicolon, I'm in the next track. P, I'm up into that track. Semicolon P, semicolon P. 
Okay, so I'm just giving you some bonuses here. Again, don't get hung up on it. You just basically wanted to kind of get your head initially looking at these edit tools. Our zoomer tool, we can zoom in. If we hold option, we can zoom out. Our trimmer tool, if we want to trim something, which, you know, this will be part of one of our exercises, I'll just select that tool. If I'm in slip mode, I can just trim in slip mode, nice and smooth, trim in slip mode. If I trim in grid mode, then I'm going to trim by my grid based on my grids. Look at the event edit selection window right up here when I do that. Notice how that changes. The bars, beats, and ticks change based on the grid. Okay. If I do this in spot mode, I want the end to be at 2-1. Oh, no. 2-1. 2-1. Boom. Trims right to 2-1. Uh, I've done that before. Um, spot trimming. I, I don't do that too much, but if you think of a, a reason in your workflow, how you would do that, then that's great. Um, our selector tool, you've been watching that. Make a selection, make a selection. You can also make a selection. You'll see this happen in the assignment. I could make a selection from 5-1, and then I could make my end selection 9-1, and see? My selection is 5-1 to 9-1. So my edit selection that I visually make here is what I'm seeing up in this window here. So let me give you that example of using that semicolon again. Let's say I was in the drum loop track and I started to make my selection 5-1 to 9-1. Oh, wait. No, I actually want that in my new bass track, semicolon. Boom. Now my edit selection moves down to the next track. Grabber, the grabber tool, you're just grabbing the entire clip. I'm in spot mode. Let me show you this real quick. If you ever have a dialog box pop up that you don't want, don't you don't have to grab the mouse and click OK. If it shows up, just hit Command period, and it will close that box. Command shift I. Oh, I didn't want that. Command period. Option shift I. Oh, wait, I didn't want that. Command period. So command period closes the window for you. Just a nice quick way to not have to grab the mouse. So our scrub tool, you can scrub in your waveform and find a, spe a specific spot. And your pencil tool, this will come up when we start talking about MIDI and automation. So you've got zoom tool, trim tool, selector tool, grabber tool, scrub tool, pencil tool. Main counter, event edit selection, your grid mode. Not your grid mode, excuse me, your grid. See that pop up show grid lines? That's turned off. Look, I'm in grid mode here, but you don't see a grid. What's going on? Oh, let me turn on grid mode. Now I see my grid. Here's your transport. This is a basic view of your transport. You can go into this menu here and you can show an expanded transport, which gives you the same event edit selection here, but also if we go into window and bring up the transport, now you'll see the similarity between the transports. So it's just a nice way to not always have to bring this transport up. If this is not showing, then you can just work up here. You can also show your MIDI controls. So now I've got my conductor, I've got my click, I've got my tempo, so you can see pretty much all your controls in this top bar here. All right. So that's just kind of a basic overview. Um, if you're in John's live session, you're going to see him using these tools in the remix. If you come back and you watch this again, you'll get a little bit more. Uh, fresher perspective, see it a little bit differently, okay? So let's go into the first step of the assignment here. Um, I wanted to bring all that up beforehand, so as I start to grab tools or point to things, it's not the first time that we've talked about it. So let's talk about editing commands. Sometimes when you're working with a clip, um, this may feel very familiar to you. This is a, this is a drum loop here. You know what this clip is
Okay, so I'm going to show you this because this you just saw what happened there. If I select this clip, okay, and I hit play, spacebar, and I hit spacebar again, notice what happens. I lose that edit selection. Notice that the clip is highlighted. Look at my edit selection window. It says I'm making a two-bar selection right now. So when I click this clip, I make an edit selection in a sense, okay, because I'm highlighting the clip. And if I hit spacebar, it's looping, right? Well, I want it to stay looping. So it's nice and looping. And then I want to hit spacebar to stop for a second. Well, when I hit spacebar, I lose the highlight. Well, then I got to click it again and then start over. Well, that gets tedious, especially if you're trying to find a specific point in the clip. This button right here, this is called insertion follows playback. Notice that it's turned on. Remember what we said last week that wherever we click in the playlist, whatever it shows on the main counter here, this is my insertion point, 6, 4, 4, 4, 4, 1, front of the session, 1, 1. Those are all, all insertion points, right? So this is called insertion follows playback. So if I start playback and then I hit space bar to stop, the insertion follows and stops at the playback, right? But if I turn that off, which N on the keyboard, I would recommend this if you're going to be working in Pro Tools, it's going to be a fun shortcut for you, toggles that, N toggles that. So if I turn it off and I highlight the clip and, I'm, and then I hit space bar to stop, I don't lose the edit selection, okay? So... Now I want to duplicate this clip so that I can start to uh, edit and start to lay out my song, okay? This could be the Samba Funk clip. It could be a kick drum, whatever. At some point, you're going to want to duplicate it. Now I'm going to show you a, a little bit of difference between repeating and duplicating because the step is actually asking you to repeat it. Both of these are up under the edit menu, by the way. Duplicate and repeat. Look at our shortcuts, Command D, Option R. So if I Option R, it's going to ask me how many repeats I want, 10. If I Command D, then I'm just going to be duplicating one at a time. Okay? Now let's say I make all those selections. Um, let's see something here. Okay, no, notice this. Look at this. My edit selection is off here because it's saying that it's 1339.59. Well, look, let me, let me back this up and undo this. Now, look, if I have this highlighted, right, this clip is highlighted, and look, it says I have a two-bar selection. But if I zoom way in on this, Look, a little bit of that clip that's missing right there. What is that? Let's see. Watch this. I'm going to no, look at this. I'm, I'm scrolling these modes here using the tilde, which is just to the left of the number one on your QWERTY keyboard. Okay, so I'm clicking the tilde. So I'm just what I'm trying to show you is I'm going back a little bit in the clip. Now, if I hit tab right now, this, is, this button is not lit. Don't worry about this, guys. Just follow me here. I'm at the end of the clip here. Now, see, now this tells me that I'm at 3-1. But I'm, I'm not. I'm not at 3-1. 3-1 is right there. And I don't know why it's doing this. Now, when you get your session, you're probably not going to see this. But I want you to think about making sure that you are making proper edit selections, especially in the beginning of when you're first creating a loop or working on making a loop or any type of a, an edit. If you're working on your grid, making sure you're on your exact grid points, because if you start to duplicate and you get down further in your timeline, you're going to wind up with clips that do not play in time with your session. Okay. So what I just want to show you real quick is that if I'm in grid mode here, and now I make the selection. So look, I'm at 3-1 in the, in the grid here. 
If I hit just hit shift return, I can highlight back to the front of the clip. Now, if I duplicate out, now look what's happening. I'm staying with an even grid length the whole time. And if I hit shift return, notice, look, now I have an even number of bars selected. Okay. So the takeaway here is just make sure when you're editing, and you make edit selections and you're working on the grid, see we're in grid mode, right? That if you make a selection, make sure you look up here and you know what your, your selection length is so that you don't wind up with uh, kick drums or snare drums or, or really any type of clip or sound that further down the timeline gets out of sync, okay? So option R, here's, what, here's the big takeaway for the actual assignment. Option R allows you to repeat. That's what we'd like you to do, but Command D also will allow you to duplicate, okay? So once I get some duplicated out or repeated out a few times, so let's say I say Option R, I do 10 repeats. Um, let's do seven. So now, notice, notice what I'm doing there. Rather than having this, this be the clip that's selected and then having to go back and, and click my grabber tool and hold shift, which I can. I have the grabber tool. I hold shift and I click and I highlight back to the front of those clips. That works. But a nice little shortcut when you're highlighting back to the front of the session is by hitting shift return. So now all those clips are highlighted. But if I start editing... And I want to move all these clips. I can hold Option. And I can click them with the Grabber tool. I'm holding Option. And then I can drop them anywhere I want. I'm not so much worried right now where I'm dropping them. But let's say I drop them right here. Okay. And I'll do it again. And I'm going to drop them right here. Now, let's just say that these are the verses of the song. Okay. Well, sometimes you have elements that you're not always editing. Right. Sometimes when you get, say, like uh, the snare drum on a verse. Sometimes it, it's, it, you know, let's let's use the term lightly, but sometimes it's repetitive or it just kind of repeats. And, you know, there's maybe some subtle nuances in there, but it's not big changes. So what you can do is you can come in here and you can you can group these clips together. And then when you group them together, you'll notice that instead of being separate, they're all obviously grouped. And then here's our clip spin. In our clip spin, it shows up as a group. And if I right click that, I can rename it. And I can name the clip. I'll call it uh, Samba Group 2. Now look what it did. It renamed the clip. It renamed the group. Now, it, let's say that I, I grabbed that again and brought it down here. Well, now I'm say I'm in like the final chorus of the song. You know, I'm using rough analogies here, but just take the ride with me. But now I want to make some changes in here, right? Well, all I have to do is clip, ungroup, or here's my shortcut, Option Command U, Option Command U. Now it ungrouped them. I can zoom in there, make an edit if I want to, and move forward. So the idea in the assignment is we want you to repeat regions, shift return, highlight them all. Now this is what I don't want you to do. Don't get confused with mix groups and edit groups. Okay. This is a little bit more elaborate mixing in Pro Tools. You don't need to get into this right now. Most of you are new. Okay, we're not talking about creating these types of groups. We're talking about working and grouping clips. So think clip group, not mix group, not edit group, but clip group. Okay, so option command G, group. So let's talk about monitor modes for a second in Pro Tools. 
When we talk about monitor modes and Pro Tools, think about, think about this. Think in terms of what is coming out of my speakers. Now, that could be your monitors in your room. In other words, the speakers that are on stands in your room or the, the desktop bookshelf monitors that you have. It could be your headphones. It could be the audio on your laptop. Now, hopefully, I, I think in your launch box, you have received a pair of speakers. I may be wrong. But hopefully, if you don't have a set of monitors that you're using with your Mbox, hopefully you at least have your Mbox hooked up. Hopefully you're shooting for getting a pair of some type of small studio monitors. If you have studio monitors and they're sitting off to the side and you're not using them, then I would recommend hooking them up. So if you didn't get speakers, um, it's not the end of the world. You probably have a nice pair of headphones that you've you've acquired. Um, which So let's just think about that. When I'm talking about monitoring, we're talking about whatever is coming out of your speakers, whether that be your headphones or your studio monitors or your laptop, okay? So Pro Tools has two monitoring modes. Pro Tools has auto input monitoring. Right here, this is our input monitor indicator up here, input status LED. Notice that it's gray right now, okay? This is all, this is all gonna get elaborated over in the next 10 minutes, or just, and I say this a lot, but just take the ride here, okay? So right now we're in a mode called auto input monitoring. And then if we come up here under track, you'll notice that I have an option for input only monitoring. So when I click this, I'm actually going to select input only monitoring. And now look, my input shows that my input monitor is enabled. Okay. When the input monitor is enabled, when this button is green, what this means is when I record enable and track in Pro Tools, you see the track record enable here. When I record enable this track, ignore this for a second. When I record enable that track, When I record enable this track, this means because this is lit green, I'm in input only monitoring mode. That means that the only thing that you're going to hear out of your speakers is the signal that is showing up at the input here. Now, this is set to bus two. So if this was set to interface, hold on. If this was set to interface to my mic, now look, you see, you can see my audio level in here, right? Now, remember, the only thing that Pro Tools is monitoring, the only thing that's coming out of my speakers right now is my voice. If you were in the room here with me, out of the studio monitors, you would hear my voice coming out of the speakers. And now when I play back, you would hear the loop playing, you see the loop is playing, and you also see my signal level on the on the meter here, right? So in the room, you would hear the loop playing back, and you would hear my voice through the headphones or through the speakers, okay? So here's an example. Working with an artist, you're the artist, whatever. You've got a couple tracks laid down. You're trying to bang out a synth part, trying to work on some background vocals, something like that. And you're just playing back monitoring your input on a track, then you would use input only monitoring because you would want to be able to hear your voice while you were playing back. Okay. So you're monitoring the input in Pro Tools. Now, this again, this we're going to say this three different ways here. So just keep, just stick along if, if it's still processing. So with auto input monitoring, remember, we're talking about what comes out of the speakers. With auto input monitoring, what happens is when Pro Tools is at a standstill, we hear my voice coming out of the speakers, and you can hear my, you can see my level in the meter there, okay? But now, as soon as I start playing back, what Pro Tools wants to do is it wants to make it possible for you to hear.
the audio that is already or the clip that is already in the playlist play back. So if I play back right now, look, see the bass clip is playing, but you don't see my vocal levels in there. But if I stop now, look what you see. You see my vocal levels in there. So this auto input monitoring mode is what we're going to use when we're punching in. We're going to do a punch in exercise. When you're making edit selections, which we're going to do in this exercise here in just a second, um, it's not it's not as important what mode you're in, but you just you're going to be toggling back and forth between these modes. So part of this exercise is to use the proper shortcut. So demonstrate the shortcut for toggling monitoring modes, and complete the assignment with auto input monitoring engaged. So if I use option K, watch my input monitor LED up here, and I use option K, I'm toggling between input only monitoring and auto input monitoring. So again, input only monitoring, oops, input only monitoring, the only thing we're hearing out of the speakers, whether Pro Tools is at a standstill or it's recording or it's playing back, the only thing that's coming out of the speakers is the signal that's at that record input, whatever's coming here into mic line one or mic line two, or if you have an eight channel interface, mic line seven, whatever. So that's input only monitoring. Option K toggles me to auto input monitoring. Now with auto input monitoring, what's coming out of the speakers? Well, right now what's coming out of the speakers is my voice because we're at a standstill. But as soon as I start to play back, whether or not there's even a clip on the track, when I play back, Pro Tools is expecting that it's supposed to be playing back a, a clip that is in the playlist, okay? Which if there was audio, which we saw there was because the bass clip is in there, so my voice isn't coming through, but the bass clip's coming through. Now, if I take it out of record mode and come back through, then you'll see that clip play again because we're not recording at all. So the, the way to think about this is that when we're using input only monitoring and we have a track record enabled, the only audio that's being monitored, on, now think about it this, on that particular track, right? Whether I'm talking about this actual track or the clip that's in technically in this playlist, we refer to this as the track. This is the playlist. This is the track. But when I'm using input only monitoring, the only signal that is showing up, okay, watch this. So if I'm playing back, the only thing that's showing up in the meter and whatever's showing up in my, let me get into input only monitoring, here we go. So what's showing up in the meter and what you're hearing back through the headphones is this drum loop clip and my voice. Even though that audio clip, that bass clip is playing back, you're not hearing that. You're only hearing what is being monitored at the record enabled input. But if I go into auto input monitoring, now Pro Tools is at a standstill, the track is record enabled, it's monitoring my voice. As soon as I hit playback, you're gonna hear this drum loop play and you're also gonna hear the clip that is already existing on the track and you're not gonna hear my voice. So this will make more sense to you when we get into the quick punch step, which is next. So we're setting you up. I'm just going to hand this to you. We want you to complete the assignment. Step two, we want you to complete the assignment with auto input monitoring engaged because we're setting you up for this step here, for this, this punch right here. This one, we're making an edit selection. Okay. So Pro Tools has two monitor modes, input only monitoring auto input monitoring, option K, option K toggles those two modes. And you know that you're in auto input monitoring when the input LED is gray. And you know you're in, in auto input monitoring when the LED is gray. You know when you're input only monitoring when it's green. So green is input only monitoring, gray is auto input monitoring. So let's talk about this next step here. 
on the new bass track. On the new bass track, set the input to bus 2, then destructively record on the bass track between measures 9-1 and 11-1-4-80. Well, you don't have to play bass to do this step, because what you don't see in the session is you don't see that there's other tracks that are hiding in this session. Even when you jump memory locations, you don't see there's other tracks. Now, if you notice right here, there's a, a track called Bass Punch. If I highlight this track, you'll notice something. Right where you need to record, there's a clip. So all you need to do is make sure that your routing is set up. Now notice this output of this track is already set to bus 2. Okay? So if I take this track here and set it to bus 2, as soon as I start recording, and these will play back at the same time, but as soon as I start recording, this is going to play through. Now look, this is this is record enabled here. So if I delete this track and I play through, look. The bass track is playing, right? But look, there's no audio showing up in the meter, even though I'm record enabled. Well, what's my monitoring mode? Oh, I'm in auto input monitoring. I'm not going to hear what's at the record input because Pro Tools thinks it should be playing back something in this area. All I have to do is hit Option K. Now I can monitor that. Now remember, I'm not recording yet. I'm just monitoring a record-enabled track. Okay? So when I go to perform this step, I don't see this track. Okay? But I'm following the instructions, and it's saying set the input to bus 2. So... Remember, you can route via buses in Pro Tools, or you can route in from the interface. So this is the duet. But I'm going to use bus 2 because, again, that bass punch is routed out to bus 2. So now I need to make a selection between 9-1 and 11-480, but I need to be in a very specific record mode. Now... Record modes we'll get into more in more depth, but let's just look at something here real quick. Pro Tools, if I just right click on this transport, on the record enable button here, I have normal record mode. This is when we're going to record from one point to another which we, we, would, we would most likely do because, remember, one of the big characteristics of a DAW is that it's non-destructive. So typically, we would probably do something like this in normal record mode, but we want you to understand why there might be a reason why you'd use destructive record mode. Loop record, which you can make a selection. You can go into loop record mode, and you can have this keep looping over and over, and you can play a guitar part, a synth part, over and over and over until you get it right. Quick punch, which we're going to cover in the next step. In real time, you can be playing back, and you can punch in and out on your track. And the destructive record. Now, this is a very seldom used mode. There's, there's not an easy shortcut to get to this mode, so you won't have to worry too much about using it. But if you were in a session and you were running out of space on your drive, you may be able to pull off doing some destructive recording to save drive space. But the other thing you could do is set yourself up for a creative challenge. So instead of always recording non-destructively and giving yourself every option in the world, you can tell yourself, you know what? I'm not super happy with that last take. But I'm not just going to delete it and let it sit, you know, over in the clips bin waiting for me to clear the excessive clips. I'm going to record in destructive record mode, and I'm going to make myself do it better this next time. So this is just kind of one of those ones to give you a heads up about the mode. It makes you think in sequence. It makes you think about having to be in an atypical mode in Pro Tools while at the same time you're performing something that is very relevant uh, to recording in a DA double, which is making record and edit selections, right? 
So I'm in destructive record mode. Remember, I right click that to get into destructive record mode. Okay. Now I can pick that from the options menu too. You see, I can pick that from options. You'll see the shortcut for loop is option L and the shortcut for quick punch is command shift P. So we'll get to that here in a second. So I need to make an edit selection on this track. Well, I'm in grid mode. I'm in grid mode. I've got a pretty, pretty much a bird's eye view of the first 50 seconds of this song. But if I needed to go right into 9-1, See, I don't, I don't click in there right away. And then, you know, maybe I'd have to zoom in. I could hit T. I'm hitting R. And I'm hitting T for zooming in and out. And I could I could get near 9-1, right? I could get near there and then hit T to zoom in and then land right on 9-1. And then I could come over here about where I need to be. And then I could grab this little handle up here. And then I need to get to 11.1480. Yeah, there. Okay. Now you see there's a multi-step way to do this, right? Which sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes you want to zoom way in. Sometimes you do want to get a little section of a clip and edit it, right? But sometimes you can just make it really easy on yourself. You can come up here to your event edit selection window, your start point, 9-1, enter. If you're in your laptop, then you're just going to have to click again here. 11, arrow left, 1, arrow, I'm sorry, arrow right, and then 1, arrow right, and then 480. Boom. Now you see it makes the edit selection for me. So I've got a track, record enabled. I've got my input set to the proper input based on the guidelines. I'm in destructive record mode. And I've got my edit selection from 9.1 to 11.1480. Now, I can just go ahead and click here. It, I'm, I'm, I'm in record enable. If I click play, I'll make that recording. Okay. Now, I can't undo it. Look, if I go to edit, Look, it's, it skips back to the prior step. So it didn't even look at that recording that I made. It didn't even store it in the undo queue. So I can go back and undo the repeat, but I can't undo the recording. Now, the other way you can do this too, once you get set up, remember, I've got my bus set up. I've got my track record enabled. I'm in destructive record mode. And I've got my edit selection appropriate. Now I can hit command space bar. I don't even have to touch the transport. Or I could hit F12 on my QWERTY. Or if I have an Apple USB keyboard with a numeric pad, I could hit the number three. So remember, you're not trying to memorize all these right now. I'm just giving you the bird's eye view. I'm giving you the bird's eye view. All right, so the the step pertaining to the assignment on the new base track, you're going to set the input to bus two, make sure you're in destructive record mode, make sure you make your edit selection properly, and then you're going to record for two bars, 480 ticks. All right, so this is quick punch, more recording. Now look, memory location two, you're going to have to jump memory locations here. So window. Memory locations, two. Now, well, I'm just going to click this and fill up the screen with my mixer. Remember, I showed you command equals toggles the mix in the edit windows. Now, notice here, when you get to this step, the clip, this clip is already highlighted. So there's some things that you can do on this track without touching the, the, the mouse at all. You can make this really fast for yourself. So we're going to... We're going to make sure that we're set up for quick punch. Now, with quick punch, we need to be in quick punch mode. Okay, so what I would do is think first for your record mode. Remember, we're, you have a track in here that's set up for your punch bus. In here, it's called flute punch. So if you notice here, here's the first phrase. 
Here's the third phrase. The guidelines are asking you to punch the first and the third phrase. Using the proper record mode, during playback, punch in the first and third phrase in one single record pass. So what this means is that you get to the you get to the uh, location location two. I'm going to hide the flute punch now. You know it's in there. You don't have to rent a flute. You don't have to be friends with Ron Burgundy. None of that, right? So we're just going to hide that. So we get to the location, and the clip is that clip that flute clip's already highlighted. So here's what I want want you to do is think about the fact that. You know you're in punch mode. You know, you, sorry, you know you're going to quick punch. So you're going to see that your punch bus is here. So that's going to trigger your your thoughts, and you're going to go, okay, punch. So you're going to go command shift P. You're, that's going to jump you into quick punch mode. Notice I'm in quick punch mode. I was in destructive record. I thought punch command shift P, and that puts me in quick punch. You can go up to options and choose quick punch if you want to. All right, but I'm just going to try to give you. Proficiency and efficiency at the same time, you make your choice of what you want to do. So you get to the location, you remember to jump into quick punch mode. Then you need to record enable the track, which we can just do by clicking this button here, right? The record enable button. But since you get to the location and the clip is already highlighted, all you have to do is just hit shift R. And then look, it's already ready to go track record enabled. Now, you don't even have to touch the mouse here. You don't have to, to click in here to get set up for that first phrase. You don't have to get back here right at the front of it or anything. You can just let that clip stay highlighted. Shift R. I'm in record enable. Quick punch mode. Now, you can do this from the transport. Just hit play. And then punch in, click the P. Okay. Or what you can do is you can hit spacebar and then use command spacebar to toggle quick punch on and off. So here's what I mean. I'm going to call it out. So I, you'll hear me go spacebar. And then as soon as I say command space bar, you'll know that I'm punching in. So when I call it out with the command, I'm, I'm punching in. So space bar to play back. Holding command space bar. Hit space bar. I'm not touching anything right now. I don't need that second phrase. Hold command space bar. And then now just space bar to punch out. Okay. So I'm just using, I'm toggling with the space bar to start playback and then holding command and clicking the space bar to punch in and out. All right. Now, rewind back. Think monitor modes. What's coming out of my speakers? Well, check it out. Look what mode I'm in here. I'm in input only monitoring. So what you'll notice is, I'm going to leave it in this mode again. Watch. When, when the flute is recording. When I punch in, you'll see the meter. You'll see audio in the meter. But this second phrase, when this second phrase just plays, notice that you won't see anything in the meter because I'm in input only monitoring mode. I don't want to be in this mode, but I want you to understand why. I want you to understand the difference. Okay, so here we go. Space bar. Command space bar. That's the flute that's in the background. Now I hit space bar. I stop there. So space bar, holding command, space bar. Still holding command, hit space bar. Now watch. No audio played back. Command, space bar. Now just space bar. So now watch. Option K to toggle that monitor mode. Now I'm in auto input monitoring because the LED is gray. Now, now same thing. Space bar to start, command space bar to punch in and out.
Command, spacebar. Okay, so we want you to do that in a real smooth step. No Command Z. No, I missed the punch. I backed up. Right? You're gonna get. You're gonna get comments on that. You're gonna get feedback saying, "Wait, no, that's not how you're supposed to do it." So we want to set you up for success. So here you go. Watch. Location one. I'm in destructive record. I jump to location two. I'm set up. Command Shift P for quick punch. Shift R for record enable. And now I just play back and do my punch in spacebar. Command spacebar. Holding command hit spacebar. And I'm not touching anything right now. Hold command spacebar. And now just spacebar. Okay, now once you have your punches, if you miss a punch, if you miss a punch, if you're short on the punch, right? That's okay because the beauty of quick punch is, and the reason why you want to limit using quick punch a lot is because what happens is Pro Tools is secretly recording in the background. If you're in quick punch and you hit play and you have a track that's record enabled, you are technically Pro Tools is secretly recording in the background. So all you'd have to do is you just come up here and grab this trim tool. You just grab the trim tool here and you just come and just pop that back. And now that's clean. A clean punch but what you want to be careful about is making sure that after you make your trims now I'm not going to go back and punch again but this would have a, a clip that I punched in as well once you get these set up what you need to do is you need to to make some fades okay because in a real world scenario you would be listening in you would probably wind up soloing this out and you'd be listening for any pops and clicks Right. And if you heard a little pop or click in there, you'd zoom in, see what was going on. Look, see, I created a fade in there. So, you know, you just, at, at, at the point of really editing, you're trying to get surgical and get all those pops and clicks out. So here's the point. In the exercise, if you're going along and you miss the punch. Oh, shift R, sorry. and you just skip and go along, then you're going to get marked off for not editing your punches. So my encouragement to you is, I mean, you see me doing it. I know I, I've used Pro Tools for quite a long time, but I'm just telling you that I think you guys get it, guys, ladies, everybody in general. As long as you practice the steps a couple times, it's not that hard. Shift R, hit the space bar, hold command, hit the space bar a little early. And just punch in and out. Okay. All right. So, and then if I hit Shift R again, I'll take it out of record enable. Okay. So now let's move on to the next step. Now, a lot of times you could be working with drum loops or you could be working with material where you're trying to edit things at the transient. I brought up this tool before well you know 15 minutes ago called tab to transient and so i'm going to show you two ways to edit at transients and then i'll show you the really really easy way to do this and you'll probably want to experiment with some drum loops on your own up here on the r and b track i'm going to use that shortcut p so i can uh, move my edit selection up to that top track there now, this is just a little one bar clip here. So if I click in here, you don't have to do this. But if I just type in 22, now I've got a one bar selection right there on that clip. So if I was down here, I could just double click this. Same thing. P. I'm using my numeric pad when I do that. So I'm not always going to call out the numeric pad because I think a lot of people are on the laptop. And I only want to call out most of the relevant shortcuts on the laptop uh, because I think I've mentioned this before. There are some times when I actually just like to work on the laptop. 
just have the laptop there for tracking, fly around the session, that's fine. So I'm not going to call out too many of the QWERTY, of the uh, Apple USB full keyboard, but sometimes I will. So let's talk about editing at transients. Here's that button I was telling you about. Right here, tab to transient. Now, what tab to transient is allowing me to do is when I use the tab key and tab to transients is turned off, if I hit tab, I'm going to jump to the front of that clip. Now, notice it's a one bar clip. So you saw that the end of that clip is 22 1. Well, with tab to transient still off, when I'm using tab, what I'm actually doing is I'm tabbing to the, to the, uh, I don't want to say the boundaries, the region boundaries. So if I hit tab again, I'm going to jump to 22.1, which is the back side of the RMB one, one bar and the front side of RMB fade. So there I am, I'm at 22.1. Now, that end of that clip is there at 33. So if I hit tab again, I'm there at 33. If I hold option and hit tab, I'm jumping backwards. So tab, with it turned off, I'm, I'm jumping clips to the front and back of each clip. Option tab, I'm jumping backwards to closer to the front of the session. Now, don't try to remember this, but I'm just gonna give you a little hint here. If you're working in a session, sometimes we talked about this button right here, this insertion follows playback. Sometimes this is turned on, sometimes it's turned off when you're tracking. Well, I find I leave it on a lot because if I'm running takes and I wanna jump back real quick. Well, as soon as I hit undo or I hit stop, I'm already back at my insertion point where I want to start from. Well, if you find out that you forgot to turn that on or you're not, you don't have that turned on. So let's just, I'm off, I'm off editing transients here. I just wanted to show you a shortcut with tab, but if I, let's just say I recorded some type of pass here, right? And then I just hit stopped and my cursor is right there. Well, rather than having to grab the mouse and then go back and click somewhere where I started, I'm, I don't have tab to transient lit. So what I can do is I can just hit option tab and then jump back to the front of the clip. So if it was one pass that you had, all you'd have to do is just hit option tab and you would be right back at the front of your recording. So that's a, a little takeaway that might hit you later on or it might, you know, you might like it now, but just wanted to get you thinking about using the tab key when it's not lit because when it is lit it functions totally differently so if i if i turn this on which command option tab command option tab toggles this don't try to remember this don't try to memorize it command option tab toggles that you can just click it all you have to do is click it right so when I use the tab button, which is obviously just to the left of Q on your keyboard, now that this is lit, if I hit tab, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to tab up to the front of the clip. Now, look what's happening. It's called tab to transient. So it's tabbing to the strongest, next strongest transient in the clip. So th this is a drum, this is a little drum clip. Okay, so when I'm tabbing, so look, Tab to train, um, uh, insertion follows playback is turned off. So I keep that insertion point. If I want to split that, edit, separate clip at selection. I can also use the B key. I can also use B just to the left of N. I can use B. So I can use Command E, right? Or I can use B. And then if I tab again, Maybe I'd want to select there, B, tab again. Okay, I'm not losing my insertion point, B, tab, B, tab, B, 
B, tab. Now I want to show you something. If you zoom way in, look, it's just into the waveform. So you could be very particular and actually want to, we're going to go into slip mode. I'm using tilde just to the left of one on the laptop, tilde. Okay. So if I go into slip mode now, I can click right where that waveform starts. You may or may not need to do that. Okay. So since I am right there, I'm just going to hit B, tab to transient, still lit, tab. Notice this, it doesn't matter if, if I'm in grid mode or not. So if I'm tabbing, I'm tabbing to transient. It's not following the grid right now. So if I'm in slip mode or grid mode, it doesn't matter. B, tab, B, tab, B, tab, B. So you see what I'm doing. I'm tabbing to transient. When I find the spot that I want, I'm using B to separate out. So now I've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Well, what do the guidelines say? You will see twelve separated regions when completed. Well, remember, you're doing this in under eight minutes. So, you know, I mean, granted, if we really went back and tried that, it would probably take us, what, 20 seconds to do? But there's a lot faster way to do this. Command Z. Now look at this. I just highlight the clip, edit, separate clip at transients. So it's kind of like a bulk tab to transient in a sense, or edit at transients. So I click at transients. Now this pre-separate amount. Okay, you're not going to use this in this step, okay? Now, I'll see some students where they'll type in 12, and where they're getting confused, where they're getting confused is that it says you will see 12 separated regions when completed. Well, we, we don't want a 12, sub, 12 millisecond pre-separate amount. The reason why this is available is that if you are editing something like symbols or a synth, or something that, that the, the transients, the attacks, aren't quite as aggressive. You may want to give yourself a little bit of room. And you can actually do this with drums. You, you saw where the pre-separate, where the, where the tab, where the transient was just getting, you know, was just inside the waveform. So you may want to do that in your own editing. But we're not calling for this in the assignment. So... The reason why that gets marked off is because we know that students are wanting to move fast, but not processing all the information, okay? It's not a 12 millisecond separation. It's 12 individual separated reasons because if I just highlight my clip, edit, separate clip at transients, leave it at zero, click OK, boom, there's my 12 transients, right, or my 12 clips in one fell swoop. So our next step here is we are being asked to create an equal power fade out from measure 311 to the end of the region. Well, look at this. I'm at 221. Okay. So if I was just if I just clicked in the timeline here and typed in 31, I'd be right where I need to be. I wouldn't have to grab my mouse at all. I could I could grab my mouse and, you know, click in here and try to land right at 31, which I did because it was already there. But if I just tried to do that fast, you know, click, I wouldn't hit it. But if I just type in 31, then I can jump right there. Now, I need to create an equal power fade out from 31.1 to the end of the session. Well, I could click and drag that. Okay, I'm just outside that clip, right? But the easier way to do this is to just use your shift tab. Now, tab to transient can't be turned on for this because if I hold shift tab, I'm going to be tabbing, I'm going to be highlighting and actually making an edit selection while I'm holding shift. Notice my, my uh, mouse pose. The arrow up is shift and the arrow right is tab with that, with that pipe there. Okay, so I'm shift tabbing, I'm, I'm tabbing to transients, but I'm making an edit selection. I don't want to do that, okay? So if you want to just click in 31, 
highlight to the end of the session, Command F, equal power. You don't have to you don't have to get into any of this right now, okay? You don't have to change your shape or anything. Just make an equal power fade. Now notice the equal power, there's a boost there. So an equal power fade, whether it's a cross fade or a fade out or a fade in, if you if you think in terms of A and B, see I'm changing that. I'm that I'm actually changing the boost on that. That's a that's a 3 dB boost there that we're actually affecting. So if I if I hit command F, right there I have a 3 dB boost at the center of the fade. Okay, but now watch if I make an equal gain fade, you're going to see a very linear line is an equal gain fade out. So um, sometimes you use an equal power fade to match up two different sources, uh, but for your fade out, uh, this is going to depend on on how you want the file to fade out. You just have to listen to it, and decide what you want. But we want you to pick an equal power fade, and then you just click OK. And then you'll see that Pro Tools writes the fade. Now, in old versions of Pro Tools, Pro Tools used to have a little folder in that session folder. Last week, we looked inside the session folder. You had the audio files folder, the clip groups, the video files, the waveform cache, the Pro Tools session folder. So there used to be a folder in there called Fade Files. And Pro Tools would actually write a little audio WAV file of a fade and it was stored in that file but it doesn't do that anymore now pro tools just stores the fades in the session file it doesn't store the fade in a separate folder anymore so let me just show you that one more time i was at 22 i need to get down to 31 i could just click in the timeline here and find my 31 and highlight out but i could also be at 22 I could click in my main counter, go to 31, turn tab to transient off, right? Option command tab, turns it off. Now I just hit shift tab and then I hit command F. Now that, that fade is there. It's under the edit menu, by the way. Edit, fades, create fade. Here's our dialog. Edit, Fades, Command F, Command F, okay? I'm just showing you what I think is the fastest way. Jump to 31, Tab to Transients turned off, Shift Tab, Command F, okay. And again, we're just hanging right now. So if if you're if you've if you're sticking with it and you're staying along here, and some things are clicking, some things aren't clicking, that's totally fine. Because hopefully you'll take time to come back through the archive. But I promise you, if you sit through this whole thing, and then tomorrow or Saturday with fresh eyes you go through the prep session, you're gonna feel like a genius because you're gonna be like, oh my god, this this feels so easy. So. You know, some people are commenting that they really like the shortcut keys and they're great. But I always, always kind of just fall back a little bit. I'll back off a little bit and I'll go, you know what? Just go for proficiency. If when you're learning, you're constantly grabbing menus, that's totally fine. But make yourself use the shortcut when you're practicing. Edit, phase, create. Oh, wait, what's that shortcut? Command F, back off it. Command F, and then use it, right? It's just like playing guitar. It's just like playing keys. I mean, if anybody sings, you know what it's like. I mean, when you're when you're learning to sing, you got to learn to sing with such control and so quiet. When you're trying to play guitar, you got to get your fingers just to lay perfectly on the guitar, and you're going so slow. Well, it's just like being musically proficient in a DAW. It takes a little bit of time and a little bit of run through. So, like I said, since so many people I've been seeing that your videos were being done way before 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, this is all going to benefit you when you're working on these assignments. Okay, so fade out. That one's pretty straightforward. Locking. This is this is super, super um, easy. Uh, we want to uh, edit lock this base here. Now, if we, 
if you notice, we have edit lock and we have time lock. Now, if we time lock this clip, that's fine, but we run into a problem. Look right here. It's time locked. It's locked to this time, 22.3829 or 54.289. It's locked there, okay? And if I go to move that, Pro Tools is not going to let me move that. But the problem is, is that it's still going to let me edit that. Now, you know, we're in a non-destructive environment, so this doesn't seem like a big deal. Oh, well, you just undo it. Well, you could really get into a nasty scenario, especially if you wound up in shuffle mode by accident. So the thing I'm going to encourage is I'm going to encourage checking out edit lock. Okay, command L. Command L. Because now watch what happens. Can't move it, right? It will not move, but look. Oh, sorry, here. See, it'll affect one or more lock clips. Don't allow it. See, that one can move all over the place. This one. And look at this. It won't let me edit it at all. So it is edit lock. You may find ways that you're bouncing back and forth between command L or time locking, edit locking or time locking. But edit locking is going to be a, a more restrictive lock. Okay, so this next piece that we're gonna look at, we talked about punching in and we've talked a little bit about the trim tool. And so we're going to talk about this, this punch in, okay? And we're trying to make this as clear as possible. Notice I got to jump memory locations. I got to move to memory location three, okay? So I'm going to go to memory location three. So what we have here is, you see this says complex drum loop 03. This clip says complex drum loop 03. And then this clip here says complex drum loop 04. Well, what we originally had was something like this. Now, that's the original, even though it's it, even though it's showing that it's complex drum loop 05. Again, just take the ride with me. The original recording was one clip like this. But when the drummer played along, okay, notice here at 37.1, this fill here right in this area. So let's say right about 36.2, if we listen in. See, he's kind of playing a little bit of like this shuffle groove, but he doesn't really play a drum fill. But a nice crash cymbal right there, right there at the end. Guys, notice again, I've got this insertion follows playback turned off, so I'm able to start at that same point every time. Okay, so now what we did was we went back and we had him punch in a drum fill. And so if you listen to this drum fill now, but notice something's a little weird there at the end. The, 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 the crash, he didn't quite nail the downbeat. So there's a, we know that there's already a crash symbol there because I took you back and you heard, hopefully I pointed it out enough, but there's a crash symbol there. Well, that punch in went a little bit long. So what we need to do is we need to get the trim tool and we need to trim this back. Well, I'm just going to tell you this. In a real world editing scenario, you would probably just do this in slip mode and you just grab your little trim tool. You see I have the trim tool here. I grab the trim tool, 
and I'm just grabbing the edge of this clip and I'm just pulling it back here like this. And then I might zoom in a little more. Something like that, okay? Now look where I am, I'm at 37001, so I'm not at 371. Well, this exercise has to do with tools and modes. So we want you to think about using the trim tool and we want you to think about what's the exercise asking from you? What are the guidelines asking you? It's asking you about the downbeat of measure 371, including a full crash symbol. So remember, we're trying to make this a, a, a fast eight minutes, under eight minutes. Well, that's why we wanna give you these little tips. So instead of having to go so slow in slip mode, if I use my tilde key, remember just to the left of the one, and I jump into grid mode, well, all I have to do is pretty much get near this and then pull it back. I, I literally, I just kind of, this sounds great, gracefully clicked at the edge of the clip and just kind of motioned towards 37.1 and it snapped it right there. And if you listen to it, now there's actually, if you're working on this, you might hear a little clip in there. There's a little bit of a clip. Look. That's why it's clipping because of this waveform right here. So you could do something like this. Just take that out. Maybe do a little, little fade there. Let's hear how it sounds. So then, you know, you don't have to do this in the assignment. I'm just showing you kind of some things that you might run into along the way. You'd probably edit that out. I would probably come in here and just do a little slight fade in. So that would be super, super clean. But just to take you back so that I'm not overwhelming you with nonsense here. I'm jumping to location three. I see I've got this punch. I could click grid or I can tilde to grid. I can grab my trim tool and just get near here and just motion towards 37.1. And then now I've got my clip trimmed exactly there. So let's do this. Give me 30 seconds. I want to grab a bottle of water and I will be right back.
All right. Let's finish up here, and then we'll take some questions here in just a second. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> last time, last time there was a break, the power went out. Yeah, no, we're good. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Thanks for sticking around here. Um, so that's the punch in, Phil. I think I think we've covered that enough. Memory locations. We're going to jump again. Ironically, we're going to move memory locations to talk about memory locations. Now you'll have seen John Barry. You'll have seen him work with the Indaba tracks using memory locations. So this is going to be a little bit more simplified version of that. But if I jump to location four, I mean, obviously I've been jumping memory locations here along the way. Now notice this, this little flag here, this little flag indicates that that's a marker. Okay. So we can actually... use those as markers in the song, or we can use them to mark uh, different editing. We can mark, use them to mark edit selections if we want, but let's talk about using them as markers in a song. So the first thing it's gonna ask us to do is to create a memory location at um, 45.1, okay? Now guys, watch the, watch the guidelines because there's a couple little extra steps in there that you know you're going to have to watch closely okay i'm not going to do every single little step because we've talked about changing track heights last week so you're carrying over from last week into this week okay but i just want you to see this this uh go to 45 one i'm going to make it at 45 one or i can make it at 43 one whatever the guidelines are calling for so let's say i want to make this at 41 one right i'm at 41 one now see this memory location windows it's it's floating well, I can make a new location, new memory location, okay? The other thing I can do is if I'm looking at my markers, since I'm at my location where I want to, which is not the location in the guidelines, by the way, but see, here's my markers. I can click this little plus sign, and now I can make that location, and I can name it according to the guidelines. I'm going to call this really cool location. You're going to name yours based on the guidelines. And then I can include time properties and general properties. So I'm going to leave this as a marker because I want to be able to see it in my timeline. Okay. Let's do something more relevant. Chorus. 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 It's like maybe like Alaskan, you know, he's singing the chorus. All right. Um, so I'm going to leave it as a marker, and then I can set zoom settings. I can do track shows and hides. I can do track heights. Okay, let's back out for a second. I want to have all these tracks fit the screen. Control, Option, Command, arrow down. I'm going to make them all fit the screen. Maybe I just want to have one track a certain height, right? Maybe I just have that track that height, whatever. But if I wanted to save that, I'm at, say I wanted it at 41. Can either click the little plus sign here or i could pick new memory location here and then i would call this say chorus and then i'd say you know what i want to keep my track heights and my track shows and hides and my zoom settings click ok now i've got one look here Click on my chorus, boom, there I am. All the track heights are back to the same. Track shows and hides are the same. So I've, I've set my location exactly where I want it. I can move that. If I said, oh, wait, I put that in the wrong spot. Let me just move that. And I can move that to the proper location. And then click on it, and then look. See, I can tell that I'm updated in the right memory location here. So now if I want to delete that location, right? If I wanted to delete this delete me location, well, I could just come in here and I could hold option. See, if I hold option, that cursor turns into an eraser, right? But I could also come up here and I could hold option and I could delete it that way as well. Now, sometimes you have certain memory locations 
and you want to update them. Now, if I go, if I look at location five, look what happens. I don't see anything. Well, I could pick a, some locations, right? I could say, you know what? I want, I want to make these in my location. Okay, you're gonna make yours based on the guidelines. But let's say I just wanted those, and then I wanted to change those to all fit the screen, or I could hold Control Option and make them all at mini. I could make a mic. I could make a micro, mini, small, medium, large, whatever height I needed to, right? And then once I got to that point, all I'd need to do is I could do this. I could grab the down carrot, right? And I could say, edit location five, and then click OK. Now look, if I toggle, look what happens. See, now I can see that location. Before it was like this. If I right click it and click OK, now look, I updated that again. Show a couple tracks here. Make them all fit the screen, toggle their heights, whatever I'm going to do. Now, look, I'll just right click it, click OK, and look, now it sticks. Okay, so make your memory location, update your memory location. And, uh, Sorry, Up, make sure you update your memory location and set it the way it's asking for in the guidelines, okay? Don't, don't do it based off of what I'm showing you here. I'm showing you the right way to do it, but you need to do it based on this piece of the guidelines. So let's look at uh, the next location. You're going to wind up back at memory location four. This is moving locations. Uh, pretty straightforward here. Now look, I can, I can agree. Uh, use my grabber tool and highlight this first clip. Look, I've got a 12 bar selection. I'm at bar 46. I need to move that further up in the session. Let's say I want to move that to bar 41. Well, I could hold shift and then click and highlight the rest of these, right? And then I could click them and move them if I wanted to. And I could, I could place them, say, at bar 41 here, right? You see how I'm really trying to get it in there and finesse it? Well, I could get mad and delete it too. I could jump into spot. Remember, I'm using tilde next to the one key. And I could click that spot and say, go to 41. And then I'll jump to 41. But let me show you this. I'm going to take you back to a shortcut we talked about before. So if I have this clip and I just select that first clip, let me get out of spot mode here. And then I hold shift and then use semicolon, then I can highlight all those other clips. Now, spot mode, click the clip, go to 41. Boom, they go to 41. Okay? So you can move them with your, you can move them in grid mode and place them at the proper location based on the guidelines. Or you can spot them in the proper place. Follow the guideline, okay? Now, the last thing you need to do is you need to spot a, uh, a, a, a clip. Sometimes you have a very specific place where you want to spot a clip. It could be a minute second location. It could be a bar beat location. So we're going to take this snare clip, and we're going to drag it onto the track that it's being asked for in the guidelines. Okay? So I'll just remind you that's the R&B track here. Now, if, if I wanted to place this at 54... If I wanted to place this at 53,240, okay? Well, I could do that probably fairly easily right here because I'm already zoomed in at the grid, right? I'm zoomed in on that grid point. But if I wanted to place that and I was, say, back here like this, well, then I could go into spot mode. Just to the left of the one, I'm going to go into spot. Then I can grab this clip and just drop it anywhere and then do 53, 2, 250, whatever, you know, wherever you wanted to put it. 53, 240, okay? So fifty-three, two, two forty. Boom. 
There it is. And then you can check it right here. 53.2240. So you're going to spot yours based on the guidelines. So um, practice it. That's the end. That would be the end of your recording. You would hit stop. You would follow the directions. You would render at 720, uh, and you would be fine. Okay. So, uh, what? Anybody have any questions here? Um, some of some of the more elaborate questions. I may um, have you email me. Uh, and we can get to that. And then uh, sometimes the, the more elaborate questions are easier to answer in uh, in an email than to, to elongate the live session here. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to take a couple questions in the archive. I'm going to ask for questions in the archive here real quick. And then if I don't see any initially, then I'm going to stop the archive. Does anybody have any initial questions here? Okay. So, uh, Dan, one is Rada, two is Rhoda. <laughs> I, that works for my name, too. I always say both. Barbie or Barbe? Um, okay. Uh, so here, anybody that's listening to the archive, this is the end of the archive. Um, if you have any any questions after watching this archive, please be sure to touch base with your instructor. Thanks very much.